A survey on university campuses posed this question. If you could ask God one question, what would it be? Would you believe that of all the responses, by far the overwhelming number one question for God was, why do you allow pain and suffering? The implication is that God is the cause, the origin of our pain. The one thing that we can all agree on is that pain tells us something is wrong. The book by David Asherick, God in Pain, is an eye-opener. The very idea of God in pain is confronting. But the good news is that God has not withdrawn himself from the pain zone, but has put himself right in it with us. It has to do with love. God is love, therefore he suffers with us. And that may seem rather strange too. But the good news is that the time is coming when, as the Bible says, there's going to be no more pain. Okay, so let's give God a chance to put his case forward. James, many people in our world today never top their hat to God, never think about God until something goes wrong and then they curse God and blame God for it. That's right. And, you know, uh, this problem of pain and how we deal with it is dealt with in the oldest book in the Bible, what we think is the oldest book, and that's the book of Job. And that idea of cursing God because bad things have come to you are expressed very well in that, the, in that book right at the beginning where, where Job's wife, after bad things start happening to him, says, curse God and just die, right? But what's interesting about the book is it starts off with an explanation, and that explanation is that the suffering that comes to Job isn't at God's behest, but at the behest of the devil. I think one of the reasons why people blame God uh, so easily and so pervasively is because they've forgotten that there is an evil persona who is going about on this earth causing pain and destruction. The second thing, and this is interesting, uh, when later on in the book where uh, God is, is conversing with Job, uh, one of the things that uh, often uh, people do is try to justify their own actions and themselves by blaming God. We say, why is there uh, starvation in Africa? But we don't ask ourselves, why do we live in a world where people like you and I uh, and uh, people in Australia and the United States, we have an you know, obesity ep epidemic, but we don't, uh, we don't share and share of our abundance, of our excess with those in need. We don't ask those hard questions. It's much easier to say, Hey, to blame it's, it's, your, else. it's your fault. Mm. Hmm. Well, one of the reasons why the, 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 the question of pain and suffering is such a problem, particularly for those who believe in God, is because the Bible itself declares that God is love. And people ask the question, if God is an all-loving God, how can he allow pain and suffering? Uh, in the book of the Bible, 1 John 4, 8, it declares that God is love. And that doesn't mean that just that God is loving. It means that God is the personification of love. Mm -hmm. And everything that he does, all, that he, all of his acts, all of the things that he says, all of his interactions with humanity are motivated by that love. <clears throat> and so much so, Peter, that um, he suffers with us. If we read in the next two verses um, from 1 John 4, um, in verses 9 and 10, it says, In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So we see a God who's willing to send his son to die for us in order that we may live again, that sin might be totally done away with for eternity. Both Daniel and Peter have, have, have given us a very wonderful foundation that God is, is love. And of course, as Peter pointed out, that's what causes some of this problem. What did Job know that Mrs. Job didn't? Well, I think what he knew was that he put his trust in total in God. He went so far that he made a statement that even if God killed him, he would still trust him. So what does that mean? To me, that tells me that Job had a loving, trusting, faith relationship with, with God that transcended the day-to-day -day circumstances that he lived in. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the kind of relationship that, that we can have, but it, it's a deep relationship. It's not a trivial thing. 
if what we're looking for is a relationship with God where when we get goodies, then we're happy with him or we ignore him more likely. Uh, but when bad things happen, we blame him. That's, that's not a genuine relationship. That's not a deep uh, commitment or uh, even a, it's really a, a rather trivial way of dealing with, with life's big questions. But what Job knew was that every good thing that had ever happened to him had come from a loving God. And every good thing that would ever happen to him would come from that loving God. And when bad things happen, that wasn't God. That wasn't God persecuting him or, or, or hurting him. It was a dark force and he wasn't going to give in to that dark force when that dark force um, uh, put trouble in his life, but rather he'd continue to have faith uh, in, uh, in, in, in a God that, that, that is the personification, as you put it, of love and he wouldn't give up on that hope. And later on in, in, in the book of Job, he says, at the end of my days, uh, I know that I'll stand before you. Job knew where his hope was based. And that's why he could keep his, his, his eyes on the prize, as we say, keep that steady gaze and have, have that kind of faith. Right. I've often heard the question, Jeff, um, where people say, why do bad things happen to good people? But people rarely ask the question, why do good things happen to anybody? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we experience pain and suffering, but we also experience loving relationships. We experience beauty in the earth. You know, we can look around at some of the, the natural beauty that the earth ex that exists, and we see this contrast. There's good in the world, there's love in the world, but there's also evil and pain and suffering. And when we look at... Um, the beginnings of the Bible, when God created the world, everything was very good. You were saying that everything that Job had that was good, he knew came from a loving God. Uh, and God loved human beings and he placed them in this beautiful planet. But after the entrance of sin, we, think, we see things going wrong. And, and even the first two, two children mentioned in the Bible that from Adam and Eve were Cain and Abel. And the Bible tells us that in, in Genesis 4, 8, that uh, Cain had an argument with Abel and Cain actually killed his brother Abel. Now, Adam and Eve loved their children uh, and yet Cain was able to find it within, within him to kill his brother Abel. Abel didn't ask to be killed. You know, when you talk about the innocent suffering, it doesn't look like Abel did anything to warrant being killed, being murdered. And yet we find it here just after the Garden of Eden, when the entrance of sin came in, that, that pain and evil begin in the earth. Mm. Yeah, I think um, evil obviously comes from the devil. That's, that's really clear. But there seems to be just this constant battle that um, Satan is ever trying to defame God's character and to give us a false view of God's character, You're placing blame um, on um, on God for the pain and suffering. But then, you know, we see characters in the Bible too who played a part in their own suffering. You know, we see David who committed adultery, in, eff in effect murdered, you know, Bathsheba's husband. And, you know, he, in the Psalms, you read about him, um, you know, lamenting his actions and his suffering. Did God bring that on him? Absolutely not. And I think there are a lot of situations in our own lives and even, you know, world events where we have played a part in our own destruction and our own pain and suffering. But how easy is it? We do what Adam and Eve did quite often. Who can we blame? We so often don't like to look at that, do we? We don't like to look at the, the possibility that sometimes we contribute to our own downfall. I remember uh, watching an interview with uh, Bono from U2 where they were asking him about uh, Africa and the, the famine uh, predominantly uh, in that country. And uh, he was asked... You know, where do you see God in all of that? And his response was an interesting one because he said, uh, I've thought about that a lot and I've stopped being angry with God because a lot of the what happens in terms of uh, some of the suffering on earth is that human beings are not very kind to other human beings and we man's inhumanity to man. And we don't like to admit that. We don't like to look at that because we recognise that we ourselves have faults and maybe we contribute to those negative uh, outcomes. Yeah, I think so often we don't have self-control. We don't want to take responsibility. We're quick to blame. I think part of it also is that you've got to have a, a view of life. And depending on your view of life depends on how you view the things that, your perspective on what happens during life. If your view is this is all there is 
and it comes and it goes, and it's short and it's brutal, which it has been for most people throughout the most, most of us history, then it's a rather dark, dismal view. If al alternatively you see life on earth as a short pre, uh, a prelude to an eternal life uh, in heaven, it sort of changes your perspective. And I, I like, like all of you, I've had my challenges with pain. My, my greatest challenge was when my first uh, child was born. And she was born uh, at only two pounds, 13 ounces, which is, I couldn't give you the metric, I'm sorry, but very small. And uh, it was really the first time that I doubted God. And I doubted God because to see my daughter go through pain and uh, the heartache that it caused, it was very hard to, to sort of reconcile, if, if you understand. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to see, and you're asking, you know, Lord, can't you do something? Won't you do something? And during that time, uh, I remember that the text that kind of stuck in my mind was, 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 comes from the Psalms where we're, we're told that weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my daughter's now almost eight, my oldest daughter, and for me, I was fortunate because the joy that has come has came very quickly. Uh, you know, uh, she's the light of my life. But I know that for, I've had friends, uh, you've gone through this experience and others, where the joy didn't come that quickly, but joy will come if we have faith and we stay the course. There is, if your viewpoint is long, the, the, the joy that we will have if we maintain our faith and our fidelity to God will come. And that, I think, puts pain that we suffer in this world in a much, much smaller viewfinder than uh, if our only focus is on this life. Sometimes we blame God for what he doesn't do, you know, sure. or for what he does seem to allow, um, you know, losing children, all this stuff going on. But... There's also a, a part of that that, you know, to go through the valleys, you, um, to, sorry, appreciate the mountaintops, you need to go through the valley. And there certainly can be a lot learned um, going through pain, like I know losing Jackson, worst experience of my life. But there have been countless women, when I've shared that testimony and the hope that I've had in Jesus, where I've been able to help them through their situation, you know, and God says all things work together for good. Mm. And sometimes you were talking about the, the children and, and uh, we, we see if we put the pain in a, and suffering in the context of the epic struggle, in the context of the battle between good and evil, um, we, we maybe see it in a different way. I, I was thinking um, about my, my son. Um, my son got um, diabetes, type 1 diabetes, before he was three years of age. And so that required him to have two needles every day, which his mother and I had to administer. And I can remember putting a needle into him at less than three years of age and him looking up to me and saying to me, without verbalising it, why are you doing this to me? And of course, in that context, he, he's an insulin dependent diabetic, so he needed that insulin. And the reason I was doing that was to prolong his life. But he couldn't understand that, you know, he couldn't understand that. And I kind of put that in the picture with God where God is trying to preserve eternity for us ultimately. Mm. And he suffers with the child through this great controversy, through the battle. And sometimes the children, which is us, don't always understand why on earth are we going through this. Absolutely. Yes, I think that's a very good uh, point, isn't it? I mean... It, it, as James is saying, the overall, you know, the big picture. Um, James, coming back to the story that uh, you talked about Job in, in, in this oldest book, um, one of the things that, as I remember the story, is that Satan is limited in what he can do. While terrible things are happening to us all, right. Satan is limited, isn't he? He is. And imagine if he wasn't. Uh, you have the personification of evil. He could torture us, unend put us in unending pain from the time we were born and keep us in that state for, you know, as long as he wanted if there wasn't a limitation. Now, the question naturally rises from that. If he's limited in some ways, why isn't he limited in total? And that's a very difficult question to answer. 
But I think what we can say with, with a, a very high level of confidence is that if we, if we lived in a perfect world while sinning, while there was sin in our world, it would A, violate the, the laws of the universe as God has expressed them, but secondly, uh, we'd sort of be in heaven already, but a very, not a heaven, but a, a sort of a perverted version of heaven. And we, at some point, we have to have faith. Now, we either have faith in our sort of doubts and our questions, or we have faith in God. And I'd prefer to have, and, I, and um, I've made a choice to have faith in the, in the Father in heaven who has given me so much good, good in my life that he has my life and my future in his hands even through the very dark periods that this life uh, can, can deal to us and all of us go through it. So as we look at this issue of pain and suffering, we, we've noticed that God is a God of love. Mm -hmm. He loves us intently. Mm -hmm. That um, evil in the world is something which God didn't originate, but through our first parents allowing Satan to come in, he's the one who's aiming to our destruction. Mm -hmm. What else does the story of, um, of Job tell you, Daniel? You know, the bad things that happen to us aren't God's will. Mrs. Job allowed the devil um, to sell her a character um, sales pitch, I guess, of God that was not real and not true. Job, Job didn't. And I think another assumption that comes through in the story of Job is his friends come and they assume that Job is suffering because he has done something and this is God's punishment on him. And that's the antithesis of what's going on. That's the opposite of what's going on. And I think sometimes, even today, we see people who are poor or people who are suffering, and we sometimes have the inclination to say, they're lazy, stupid, whatever it is. But sometimes people suffer. This, we live in a very broken world. Mm -hmm. Bad things happen where there is, uh, that you can find sort of silver linings if you want to, but just really terrible things happen with really not a silver lining in this life. The only silver lining or the only hope we have is for the life to come. And it's not necessarily the people's person's fault. Innocent people suffer. Uh, and that's part of living in a very broken, sinful world. Now, our hope is to transcend this world through our faith in Christ. So what you're saying then in that context is that uh, we, pain tells us that something is wrong. Without that pain, we wouldn't know that there was something wrong in our world. Exactly. And we're in the middle of a battlefield and we, we need to, to be aware of that so that we can uh, make the right choices uh, about where we want our future to be. Um, when we talk about God is love on, on the one side and then, you know, we have the enemy as well, uh, which is the devil. But when we talk about God is love, when our best image of God is in Jesus, when God came to earth as a person in Jesus, um, what was God like then? What did Jesus do? What kind of a person was he? And we find, um, for instance, in Matthew, there are many instances where Jesus healed. There were many pe instances where Jesus showed compassion for people, not people who just happened to be with his family or even one of his nation. We have a passage here in Matthew 8, verses 13 and 14, where a, a Roman soldier, a centurion, comes to him and says, I have a servant who is sick. And Jesus heals that centurion's servant. In other words, Jesus gives us a demonstration of the fact that God's character is love. Yes, well, I, I, I want to just pick up, James, this point that Peter just mentioned because I think it's an important one, and that is that pain tells us something. That's right. It does. And I think that, once again, it's necessary, it's a necessary part and parcel of living in a sinful world. We don't need pain in a perfect world because you don't have the, all the issues that go along with it. But if we did have a pain-free, immortal existence in a, in a world that was deeply sinful, well, first, first those, those two things are incompatible because one of the instincts that people who are sinful have is to hurt other people, and sadly, I mean, this is when we see this through war and abuse and all the things that, that go on. 
But if it was conceivable, I think that, that we wouldn't necessarily f uh, understand our separation from, from good and from the source of our life. And because we do feel it, and we know that there's a problem, we look around, we feel it intensely ourselves, we see it in our children, we see it uh, in our sort of global experience, um, it does cause us to ask the questions. Sometimes the questions asked, I would argue, in the wrong way, as in with the university students, mm. but at least it's posing out the question, something's wrong, we all know something's wrong, and the question is, the, really the question for each one of us is, what answer do we, do we select? The curse God and die answer, which, which Job's wife had, or Job's answer, which is, I'm gonna trust God mm. no matter what. The problem with us in the West is that we don't feel any need. You know, everything's good. We've got three meals, house, job and so forth. And sometimes God has to allow us to go through experiences to shake us and help us to see that we are not the master of our lives at all. I think sometimes we're, you know, we the average lifespan in Australia is in the 80s uh, for men and women these days. And we sometimes we think, well, that's a lot of years. If you took 80, let's just say 100 years, you divide it by eternity. You can't do the math because it doesn't work. You know, you can't divide it by infinity. But the point is, we come and go like that. You know, Ecclesiastes says, in the book of Ecclesiastes, we're like grass, we grow and we go away. And I think it's one of those illusions that people have like in, in Western countries. Well, we can have a good life. We'll have a nice, good, long life. Uh, but I remember one thing my dad told me just about a year before he died. He was about 74 at the time. He said, you know, people think you get old and you don't want to live. He says, he said, told me, I want to live now more than I ever wanted to. Mm. The Bible does tell us that this dark story is coming to an end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we are in the battle, we're in the midst of the battle, but God is going to bring it to an end and that will take place at the second coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in terms of the, the um, promise that we're given in the Bible, we come to Revelation 21 uh, verse 4. And uh, it tells us there that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. The story of the Bible is a story where our very first parents in the Garden of Eden, we mentioned in a previous program, made a choice, and it was a bad choice. It was a choice to believe the devil over the promises of God. And Every day, today, we get to make choices about whether we want to be in this uh, kingdom that God talks mm. about where God's going to wipe every tear from our eyes. He's going to, uh, there'll be no more pain, there'll be no more suffering and there'll be no more death. Do you know that's really beautiful? But I know today there'll be people watching and I've been in a situation myself where, you know, the ending is beautiful and it's a promise and we know it's going to happen. But what about right now? You know, are we alone? Does he just, you know, chuck us out in the world and say, hey, fend for yourself until I come again? Absolutely not. Are not five sparrows sold for a penny, two copper coins, and not one of them is forgotten before God, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Wonderful, isn't it? Yes. Well, we have noticed again today as we've opened God's word that God is love that he is not the cause of pain. Even though insurance companies say the bad things are an act of God, that is not true. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we have an enemy, that enemy that has been allowed to come into our world. He's the cause of all the problems. But the good news is that God is still in control. And in this great epic story, this great uh, conflict that's going on between good and evil, between Christ and Satan, the Bible tells us the time is coming when pain is going to end. You know, it's interesting if you follow the movies that uh, every great movie ends with the idea that we all live happily ever after. You may remember when you were children and had those stories read to you, fairy tales, everyone lived happily ever after because deeply in our hearts is a desire to live happily ever after. Titanic is another illustration, Star Wars, Avatar, all great feature films that ended with the idea there was a war and, and, and conflict, but finally they lived happily ever after. And I want to assure you 
again today that the Bible ends on this positive note, that uh, one day very soon Christ is going to return to this earth and that which is the desires of every person's heart, to live in a world where there's no pain and no suffering, no heartache, uh, as we were just reading a moment ago in Revelation 21 verse 4. And I'd like you to underline that in your Bibles. Uh, Revelation's the last book in the Bible. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. You think of that. No more tears. Nothing that will ever bring tears to our eyes will be in that world. There will be no more death. How wonderful that would be. No more partings, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. You think of a world like that. To miss this world would be to miss every wonderful hope that, that humanity can ever have in their hearts. And that's why God has written it so clearly in his word. And I want to encourage every viewer today to, to accept Jesus and to, uh, to be ready for his soon return because Jesus is coming soon. This world is not going to go on like it is now forever. Soon, very, very soon, he's going to return. And I trust that you and I will make our decisions because every one of us has to make that decision. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Our Father in heaven, I thank you again today for the world that we are just reading about where there's going to be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more heartache. We long for that time, Lord. May it come quickly. And I pray that you'll bless every viewer no matter what the difficulties that they may be experiencing. Some have lost loved ones. Some are having difficulties with their children, with their parents. Lord, you only are the one that knows the difficulties, but we believe that you have the answers to our every need. And so bless every viewer today and keep us faithful until the day when Jesus will come. I pray for Christ's sake. Amen. <laughs> 